solid food or milk? Which one should you want? Let's let the Bible talk to us. See you in a second. Wednesday, friends. My name is Brandon, pastor here at Church Unlimited. Welcome into your midweek boost. We're already three days past church this past Sunday and three more days until. So let's get filled up with this new covenant reality. This past Sunday, we had a conversation at our church called Solid Food, where we really discussed Paul's conversation about the difference between milk and solid food. What does this mean precisely? All of this, of course, comes in the context of a series we're doing called The Gifts of the Spirit. What we found is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is dealing with a very difficult subject called division. The church is divided along the lines of who's the most important, who's got the bigger gifts, who's got the smaller ones. The ones with the bigger gifts, we like them a bit better. And this is not how the body should operate. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, we summarized this a few weeks ago. Speaking of the gifts, it says this, Concerning your question about spiritual communicators, this is how Paul opens this chapter. Don't believe just any speaker. What they say about Jesus as the Christ will tell you everything you need to know. The gifts of the Spirit are intended to do one thing only, to communicate Jesus through you. There's something in you that God has planted in you that's intended to show something about Jesus to the world around you. If we go down to verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 12, we see this reminder of the division that the Corinthians are experiencing. Watch the language he uses. They're diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Uh, differences of ministries, but the same Jesus. Diversities of activities, but the same God. Diversity, same. Differences, same. Diversity, same. Why does he use these contrasting words? Because the diversities were clear to the people. But what Paul wanted to show was that these diversities are actually intended to show unity. In other words, it's the unity of the church that's clearly seen through its diversity. And while the diversity was causing separation among the men, Paul was trying to bring them back. Look, your differences are actually important to show something beautiful, the unity of a body in operation. Verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians, same chapter, 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Many one, many one, many one. Why? Because there's division. Now, if we rewind a couple of chapters to kind of find context, why is this letter important? Well, it's a letter of correction. Paul is trying to help these Corinthians, not a single cultural Christian among them. No one was raised in a Christian church. It didn't exist. They had lots of gods. And in the lots of gods conversations, there was lots of different thoughts of how you honor a God. And now he's trying to show them Look, these diversities, things that you do differently from one another, let's bring them back into the purpose of the gift itself. In 1 Corinthians 3, the divisions come up. Verse number one, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, let's be careful before we define spiritual and carnal, because we don't know yet. We don't know what carnal means. He tells us in just a minute. But what I see is a tendency by some people to say a carnal person is someone that's sinful, someone that's watching too much Netflix, they sleep too long, uh, they're not honorable to a particular type of person. Well, these aren't really the descriptions that Paul uses carnal in. Let's let the Bible teach us. Verse number two, I fed you with milk. There's a relationship to carnal. And not with solid food, spiritual. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able for you are still carnal. Keep in mind, we don't know what carnal means yet, so don't jump the gun. You're still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? What is this carnality? Is it a bunch of people that cuss too much? Are they staying out too late on Friday nights? Well, Paul is about to tell us what their carnality is in reference to. Verse 4. He says, 4. Everything I've just said, let me summarize it. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? There it is. This carnality is a reference to men being drawn to other men, to a human being drawn to the teaching of another human being, rather than the person that's being taught. Let me say it like this. Here's carnal. Placing man at the center of the gospel. 
Man gets the attention. So for the baby, for the carnal, the milk drinker. For the baby, the emphasis is on who is proclaiming, not who is being proclaimed. Big difference. Paul is proclaiming. Apollos is proclaiming. Peter is proclaiming. But what the Corinthians have done is they've divided among the actual preacher instead of unifying around the one whom the preacher is proclaiming. And this is Jesus. Friends, we don't gather as believers just to magnify the men among us. Rather, it's those among us that reflect together a beautiful picture of who Jesus is to the world. So carnal, putting men at the, at the center. Spiritual, simply enjoying who Jesus is as the fulfillment of God's promise of righteousness. Spiritual food, solid food, is the reminder that you have been made right with God by what Jesus did. Not because a particular preacher taught you that, but because what you were taught is the whole point of the preacher. In, Matt, in Hebrews chapter 5, we have very similar language show up. Verse number 7, it says, The Christ who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, we're in the Garden of Gethsemane now, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his godly fear. Now we know that Jesus was heard, but he didn't just pray one thing. The conversation with his father wasn't just take the cup from me. We know that this was a, a terrible uh, suffering he was about to go through. Rather, what, he, what God did do was preserve him was to give him strength. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, was to give him strength to endure the will of God, that the Lamb of God would suffer death, not because God wanted to kill his only son, but because a sacrifice was necessary for the forgiveness of not just a few sins, but the sins of the entire world. Now keep in mind this idea, verse number eight, it says, even though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. I've heard people take a verse like this and they try to teach their children, look, Jesus was, he learned obedience too and he suffered through it. So get in here, boy, you're about to suffer a little bit like Jesus did. That's not what this verse means. This verse has one meaning and one meaning only. And by the way, when you establish what a verse means, what a conversation of parable, when you establish what it means, which is consistent throughout scripture, when you establish that it needs to hold that forever, and so when we figure out what this means, let it be that always. He learned obedience. This idea of obedience is repeated throughout our New Testament. In Philippians 2.8, Paul writes of it. He says, being found in appearance as a man, as a human being, he, was made a, he humbled himself, watch this, and he became obedient. He learned obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's the things which he suffered. Christ learned obedience. He tasted, he experienced the obedience of God to God's plan, God's will. How? By the things he suffered. Where did he suffer? On the cross. In Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Do you see it? There it is again. It's Jesus' obedience. He learned, he tasted, experienced obedience to the will of God that he would ultimately suffer for your sake. Again, in Hebrews 2, 9, it says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, that would be as a human. For the suffering of death, that's his obedience, he was crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, here comes the result of his obedience, might taste death for everyone. In other words, Jesus tasted, experienced the obedience to God's will by dying for you. Isn't that incredible? It says he tasted death for everyone. He experienced what you deserved, what I deserved. Not because I had done one thing wrong, but because the nature of sin was destined to be judged. And judgment came. Jesus was lifted up on a cross. At one point, Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I'll draw all to me. Doesn't say all men. That's the italicized word men is in your translation on any translation of your Bible. It's italicized. It wasn't there. The context proves out. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all judgment to myself. And that is exactly what he did. Aren't you thankful that he learned obedience to the things he suffered? He tasted of obedience. He experienced obedience to God's eternal plan. Verse number 12, it says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
you still need someone to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, let's go back through the Old Testament. That's the oracles of God. And let's try to find Christ again. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. The reality is, is that solid food is a declaration that Jesus' work was enough to make you right with God. And that should thrill you. The diet of milk, mm, let's move on from trying to establish, is Jesus the Christ? No, he is. He came and he did what he said he'd do, redeeming you, giving you eternal life simply by faith. I'm thankful for his obedience today. I pray this message has had meaning in your heart this afternoon. I pray also the rest of your week would be an absolute blessing to you. If you're in Birmingham, come see us at Church Unlimited this weekend or find us online. God bless you. Have a marvelous rest of your week. We'll see you soon.